everybody, thanks for tuning in. Working class on DeerCast here on DeerCast. And of course, the Turkey OG series is back this year. This is the second installment for 2023. I think this is number six of the Turkey OG series, Mark. Uh, Mark Jury, my co-host on this. Obviously, the man behind lining up these legendary OGs of the turkey hunting industry of what it is today. So thanks for doing this, Mark. Yeah, thank you, Kurt. And we've got uh, one of my favorite people in the whole world today, Mr. Toxie Hayes, the founder of Mossy Oak Camouflage, one of my best friends, a brother to myself and Terry. And, you know, it goes all the way back to when he first brought Mossy Oak to the public back in 1987. And then Toxie and I met in 1989, and we've just been like family ever since. So it is an honor and a privilege to have Toxie on today. Toxie, love you, brother. And welcome. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, like I told y'all, I'm a, I'm the world's biggest homeboy. I don't, I don't do a lot of them. I, I jump on ours a good bit because it's right here and all, but, uh, I told, um, I told your partners probably you can count them on one hand, the people I'd, I'd probably do that for. Uh, I'm just so reclusive and whatnot, but I, you know, as, as we get a chance to maybe teach people stuff, it's to me, I get the, the older I get, it's less about technique. Although, you know, I've, you know, people ask me, how did I learn all this? Well, I screwed it up for long enough, and that's, that taught me something. But I think this is 53 years, I think, since my first turkey hunt with Daddy. That's a pretty long time. But the thing I was getting to is the, man, turkeys come and go and all that. And I just, it has been my passion uh, all my life since I first went. But the most cherished thing is those friendships like we have with Mark, like I have with Mark because it's fan time and no matter what happens, uh, even if we have a ruffle between, cause he's got a lot of business stuff that interfaces with us. It didn't make any difference. Um, it was just that chemistry at the very first, it's like the love at first sight thing. It sounds kind of kooky, but it was. And uh, it was just the main thing is what turkey hunting as a sport and all of them, bow hunt everything can give you is so much more than the deer or the turkey. If you have those relationships, built in and around the sport it is the thing that life was made for it it is and toxie's a passionate guy about so many different things um he's a passionate guy about business family his community but he is a dyed in the wool turkey hunter and honestly that was, that was our connection way back when when i first yeah. met him in 1989 we met at a turkey calling contest and many people know him as the founder of mossy oak I know Toxie as, like I said, a brother and also one of the best turkey hunters I know. And I know a lot of really good turkey hunters and he is absolutely death on them. But I think the thing that makes St uh, Toxie stand apart from, from many that I know, he's more worried about keeping them alive than he is killing one. And I think that separates him from many others. And I think that's a, a, a path a lot of turkey hunters are going down these days. And I know when I have a question about turkeys, I'll call Toxie first because he's so into the to the resource. Like he's he's about them 365 days a year, not just the 30 or 40 during turkey season. And and that's hopefully the greatest compliment I can give you as a gamekeeper, Toxie, because you are more worried about keeping them alive than killing them. Yeah, I mean, um, it, it it's really just common sense. I mean, uh, 30 something years ago, people would ask me what was my philosophy about deer you know and even turkey like what what's your top thing i was like and i know this sounds real country to part of the world it's like i was like you know i kind of figured if you ain't there you can't kill them and i know that sounds stupid but i mean it's kind of philosophy mm -hmm. <laughs> and that broadly it's it, it's true as anything can be and so what i want more than killing one is to be able to you know it's we call it as a game keeper, that life of abundance. I want to be able to go out and hear them. You know, if I if I go out and hear some and get my tail whipped, I'm fine. I, literally. I guess enough of it to catch up with you. But but to go out and not hear anything is so depressing. Because, I mean, time's ticking on your life all the time. And to miss a day, to miss a sunrise where you don't get to experience this, I'm so addicted to it. So, having said that, I worked so hard, especially in the last years, as Mother Nature and the ecology of the world in ways we're, you know, starting to understand have uh, produced a lot of headwinds to our great bird. Uh, we worked really, really hard at um, raising them 
everything from the trapping to the predation to the nutrition at certain times of year and even the harvest. And, you know, to, uh, to much of my pride that the kids, my son-in-law, you know, the three of us, they have access to all my stuff and, and even others. Uh, you know, when we know a place doesn't need to, and I've come to understand you need a certain degree and number of those mature breeding gobblers. You can't just kill them all down or you're going to have big headwinds to your hatch. So my having said that kind of like deer, we kind of predetermine what we think we have, uh, you know, to hunt and having a great hatch and having a bunch of jakes, that surely helps. But that don't mean you can go kill all your turkeys. Um, I think, you know, more and more people are getting to where uh, they want to have great turkey hunting. And so I love the fact that people are starting to actually brag. Instead of bragging they killed a limit, they're starting to brag they quit before their limit because their place didn't need any more kill. And I, you know, that's the whole thing is that if we can be connected to the whole circle, you know, not just consuming but providing and creating, then, you know, um, the future's ours, especially as, and not to go on and rant too much, but I just want to be sure everybody knows this, this conservation and this uh, gamekeeper stuff is for everybody. I mean, and I say it all the time, don't let your eyes glaze over. It could be 10 acres or 100 acres or 1,000 acres. It doesn't matter. Even if you have a small track, if somewhere you go, someone, somewhere you can care for, you can make a difference. Everybody can. In fact, I was sitting in a big meeting with people from U.S. Fish and Wildlife and National, you know, uh, the U.S. Forest Service and all these big agencies and, you know, DUNWTF and all of them this week at the convention. <clears throat> and they agreed the most important thing is the private citizen, not the big organizations, not the, you know, Johnny Morris cutting big checks or Toxie doing stuff through Mossy Oak or, you know, um, whatever, public lands and the government and, it's, it's everybody, and it's for everybody. And that's when we really make a difference, when each one of us becomes that gamekeeper mentality where we're going to – and plus, you're, let's face it, selfishly, your hunting's going to get great, way better too. And I just want to be sure everybody knows, and that's what we're trying to do with our life in this gamekeeper cause, is wake up everybody – and not only that, everybody, Karen, can make a difference in, quite honestly, affecting votes and maybe Congress or something to the benefit of hunting and wildlife. So um, I just want to be sure everybody's paying attention and, you know, make your own way. Um, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm telling you what works for me, what I like. But I'm I'm cool with whatever makes you get through life and uh, enjoy the outdoors. I do love that, man, like Toxie, because – as I get a little older and I'm able to acquire some of my own property, even if it's a smaller track, you know, when I was younger, you know, shooting turkeys or deer or whatever was like, it's, it's always fun. Like I always enjoyed that. And, but as you get older, you kind of understand like the whole circle process of it, or, or maybe not that you didn't understand it when you were younger, but I appreciate it on a different level now, especially not having my own piece. Like if I do food plot seed and watching turkeys in it, and even well, if I planted it just in thought for deer or thought for this or seeing songbirds benefit from it or whatever, it's just like a good feeling or to see, you know, deer and turkeys for the following year to come and just knowing that you're going to have, or hopefully have a season to look forward to next year and the year after and the year after. Uh, you know, absolutely. I just thought you're talking, I thought of a great analogy and I hope you don't get mad at me, Mark, because I'm putting you out there on this one. His, he is as good. He, he can talk about me all he wants. He is as good as walks. But people will wonder, we talk about all this, and they say, oh, that sounds great. I see Mark smashing all kind of big bucks off his place every year. Him, his daughter, his, you know, his mom, his brother, all these guests. But guess what? Mark has done a brilliant job. And, you know, it's not just one place either. He's got a steady crop of more coming all the time. And he knows exactly what he can and can't do. And he harvests to that. So, to the degree he knows that he has all these other deer coming on, coming on, coming on, then he can enjoy shooting a bunch of deer. But the point is, you still have to, if if, if for some reason, and he's had years like that, you know, um, EHD years and stuff, when he had to cut back, he did. And so if you get your place going, and turkeys are a little trickier 
and that there's so much working against them, even more than deer in successfully raising a young one. Uh, but if you do the things and it's not that complicated, it takes some work on your place. It isn't a one hit wonder, but over time, let's say I would bet you three to five years, you'll start to see a really big difference. And if we have good weather conditions, you really could see it sooner. Then you can have a place with so many turkeys coming on all the time. You can harvest a lot if that's what you're after. No problem. Uh, but just think about how, you know, Mark's able to do what he does because He's managed it for so long, and he's got this, like, new recruitment coming in every year. You know, I think with any population, whether it be deer or turkeys, you mentioned EHD, you get dips in deer populations. You have to right. adjust to that. And I think with turkeys, for too long, we've not paid attention to the overall numbers. You know, you go out for a couple, three weeks. Hey, I'm hearing a turkey. I go kill him. Well, are you still hearing what you heard five years ago? Or are you only hearing one where you used to hear – six or seven and we started keeping tabs on everything we heard every adult gobbler we saw wow. what are how many pults we saw during the summer how many pults per hen we saw how many jakes we see the next spring and, and we have this huge table and we flow farm from farm exactly what our turkey population is doing through time so that we can see those dips and peaks and when you're at a peak you can press the gas a little bit and then when you're in a valley, in terms of overall numbers, we lay way off, you know, because I, I want that baseline to stay the same, what you would call like a seasonal average, if you will. We started doing that about a decade ago. And that above anything else, just having a realization and an understanding of what that population is doing has helped us so dramatically. Yes. You know, I used to think I didn't know. I mean, I'm talking about this today. And honestly, just in the last year or two, I've learned so much through the biologists we work with. Uh, a lot of them, but it, namely Dr. Chamberlain, because he's done this research, you know, and that that's why I love research, because it's actually, you know, the truth will set you free. It's the truth. And I always thought beginning of the season, one of the best, healthiest things you could do was, you know, even if you had to bushwhack him or something, is kill that old boss that had all the hens and it kind of opened up the goblin for other turkeys and split them up more and all. He's absolutely the wrong thing to do. He's yeah. proved it. Yep. Those don't go right back to another gobbler. It'll actually decrease the number of eggs or the potential success of the hatch. And they've even changed the law in the state of Alabama now. They move the season back 10 days, a little controversial. And for the first 10 days after that, you can't use a decoy. Then after that, you're fine. And they're just trying to preserve those. It's kind of like the herd bull and elk. And they've proven now that taking them out too soon can really drastically affect that. I would have never known that. I would. I was always of the mindset, kill the boss, and that'll wake up and let some others gobble that hadn't been able to. But I was wrong. You know, I, I agree with that. That's the other thing. Dr. Chamberlain made that statement about four or five years ago on a podcast we were doing with him, with right. Matt and Tim on 100% Wild. And I immediately, it rang, it hit, hit me right then. It turned on a light bulb, and we stopped shooting him from that day forward. That, along with habitat improvement and taking care of those nest predators, which I, I learned how to from Toxie as much as anybody, that those three things have yep. made drastic differences in our turkey population. And I'm, I'm telling you right now, I've got more turkeys on my Iowa farms than I've had in the last 20 years. I mean, it has made a huge difference. And that, all that comes from research and just using a little common sense approach out there. Yeah, and the, like the predator thing is a big deal. But you can't just go tickle it. It won't make that big a difference. And two things. One is, and Chuck Sykes, a director of, uh, um, in Alabama, uh, was a biologist by trade before he got that job. And he made a great comment. I like Bart. I like to give credit where I get them from. He said the, the nest predator trapping is kind of like keeping your grass mowed. You just don't go out there the first of summer mow it one time and forget about it. You have to keep on. And, I mean, it's kind of like – the the, the weeks of mowing grass is like years. You want to really hit them hard right before the nesting season the best you can because you could literally wipe them all out of your place and in maybe six months a whole new crop will move in to where your food sources are of predators. So he made a great analogy. You just got you got to start, and Mark's seen that now. You got to start and then continue it. And, you know, it won't necessarily mean what, what I think it'll mean um, – especially after maybe two years, is that if we have a poor hatch, your hatch won't be as poor as others. And then when we have a good hatch, you might have an explosion of Amen. pulse. 
And, you know, so you're just get ahead of the game. And the thing that happens, once you've had that population base build back up, it's going to then be easier to hatch turkeys because you got so much more candidates, you got so much more balance in him, the gobble ratio, you know, and you're conscious of that now. So uh, the one thing, you know, I hate that I'm like this sometimes. I have to get back in the corner before I really get busy. Or you you almost lose something you love so much. It'll really get you off your butt. And I think that's the way turkey hunters, that are, by and large, are today. And it's forced a lot of us, even me and Mark, to be so much more mindful of how we walk in life as a gamekeeper. And I'm, I'm fired up about it, honestly. Big time. Big time. And I, I think – and I'm going to say one last thing, and then we'll change subjects. But you also have to be mindful of what habitat you're dealing with in terms of whitetails, turkeys, raccoons. Like, we have certain trap sets – There'll be a coon in it every single day. We've got farms where we'll have we'll be five for five every day. And I asked Tad, I go, how is this possible? Tad's a big trapper. He's been a trapper for, you know, 50 years. He goes, well, a raccoon's, you know, home core is 20 square miles. He said, you're never going to run out. And I was like, yeah, but they're coming to me. I mean, it immediately hit me. So it goes back to keeping your grass mode. Like, you're doing a lot of good if you can keep consistent with it. Uh, yes. but you're, you're just taking more and more and more out of the population. If you've got good habitat and they're coming to you, put more traps out, take more out. You're helping the whole, the whole ecosystem. If you've got really great habitat, I've got one farm that's got two creeks that join. And I mean, it is raccoon central. <laughs> like if, if raccoon ground had a price to it, it'd be the highest <laughs> price piece of dirt in Decatur County because we've caught so many on that particular farm because they're up and down those creeks and we're catching so many. So also be mindful of their ecosystem and and how you can do the most good there. We've got other farms where we catch very few. They're just not there as much. Uh, but right. that could change coming into different seasons. I like it. Yeah, that's something I, I think I feel like I see more of now just in general as people trapping raccoons it's something i personally need to do a better job of like the farm i have has got a river on the north end and it's like it's sick with raccoons so i just need to i need to get in there it'd probably be simple for me to get traps on each end and and do a better job there but i feel like i'm seeing more of it in the last couple years than i had in the past so it's a good thing no question well at this particular convention i'm sure toxie can attest to this like we used to all sit around and talk about you know how to kill a turkey. Now we're talking about how to catch more coons. Like the conversation has shifted. Yeah. Raise them. Yep. That's what I, uh, my nickname, I started that years ago and someone will start sending pictures of a bunch of poles. And that's what I call it. I call it sunshine. That's the, that's the brightest, most cheerful thing in nature to me to see a bunch of poles. Amen. I love it. Amen. And they're, a, they're a walking miracle. When you they see are- when you see a turkey walking through the woods, it is a miracle that it got to that age, regardless of what age it is. I don't see how they ever had to make it, honestly. Toxie, what about the wild turkey? Like, what's so special about the wild turkey to you? You know, everything. And part of it is just, you know, it got ingrained. But what my first experience was with my dad, of course, Mr. Fox. And, uh, you know, my first you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. It was in the dark. We went by boat miles up a river and land. It was what, you know, for me, such a exhilarating experience doing all that, you know, because he was all had at it. And uh, you go through as dark as it can be, maybe a little moonlight, but it's kind of, you know, as, as a kid, I'm like, what, an eight or so. And uh, the first thing ever was, hey, and this is in South, South Alabama, the deepest, rattliest, booming gobble you'll ever hear comes from those. That's where the turkeys actually came from in the whole country. That's the first experience I had. Wow. Maybe 150 yards from us. And, I mean, it blew my face back like a wind burn, you know, like the whatever, a solar flare. And, I mean, just the exhilaration from that. And then he began to gobble and he began to answer stuff. And anyhow, he was gobbling his brains out, you know. And even on the ground, he flew down, whatever, and came up there, ended up coming up there, gobbling in our face a couple times, and daddy killed him. And it was like, oh, my God, I had no idea that's what it was like. So for whatever reason, you know, you're, we're, psychology one-on-one, we're all, uh, you know, what we were imprinted as, uh, and that imprinted me. So to this day, I'm still a little kid when I go out in here and gobble. I literally 
and kind of at peace once and, and they're there now it's hadn't been out because i'm getting old but they're starting now i just know the weather enough to know there's goblin right now and uh once i can go out and i can you know know that i could get up and go listen to some i'm at peace killing them or not again i'm human and you know if i was having a dry spell i'd probably get frustrated and, and get mad at them and stuff but i just love being able to go here it's something about it to me that connected and of course as a sport you know um there's really nothing quite like it. I know and some people, elk is the same or higher. For me, it's turkey, but it's the same thing. It's that kind of, so many things, I believe, two hunters, two outdoor, for fishermen, kind of at a deeper level than we even realize is a connection with nature, a connection with earth, where we came from. And um, I don't know, there's something about turkeys and calling them, talking to them, making them gobble. I mean, Mark's making one stand on his head, I can promise you. And, <laughs> It's just, it's addictive, you know, and it's not like you're just sitting there waiting. I love all, I mean, I love bow hunting. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's so hard today for me to pull out a rifle and go deer hunting. And I need to stop and enjoy it. I'm getting older. It's not as easy to climb trees. I love bow hunting. It just, it's in my blood, but the turkey and calling them and that whole part is to me what really sets it apart. And it's something magic about when you lay your hands on one. And Mark can speak to that too. I didn't expect like every color in the rainbow all of a sudden to be shining off of my, I, I just never realized it till I laid my hands on one. So there's something, you know, sounds kooky or not. It is what it is for me. It's something pretty much spiritual about being up amongst them and killing one. I never take it for granted. Not a single time. 100%. There's also something about the time of the year that it occurs in the spring. You know, in the fall, everything's dying and you're getting colder. And it's just like in the morning when the sun comes up, that's the start of a new day. Well, the spring is the start of a new year, essentially. And that that feeling you're out there with life of, of, in abundance and you're looking at this plant trying to identify it and that bug and you've never seen it before. It's like it is an endless wonder of, of wildlife, b borrowing the, the name of Johnny's um uh museum down there like you just you're in amazement every single day the weather's all always awesome and the temperatures are great you know because it's 60 70 degrees and everything about the spring is just so awesome and the turkey takes it to that higher level i call it you know even in because i'm a christian the season of rebirth but it's the rebirth of the whole earth you know and like you said things wake up birds are singing more you can smell flowers blooming i mean I just, I just, I don't know. I believe there's an energy to the whole way the earth and the universe and all that works. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everything's fired up and waking up and, and it's just something about being connected to it. It, it. it is such a rush. Some of my favorite hunts actually are like an afternoon hunt in a beautiful spot where I'm not even hadn't located anything. And I just eased into a spot. I feel like it's going to be pretty good. And I just sit there and, if I don't strike one right away, I'm so patient. And I don't, you look, I don't do it enough, but I just stay there and I just enjoy the woods. Honestly, it's a great way to do after hunt, noon hunt, if you know you're in them. But it's so much fun, even more so than kind of running and gunning, to just sit there and, and kind of slow down and experience everything out there because uh, it's, let's face it, it's a miracle. It is. Yeah. I love that. How long did you turkey hunt? I mean, before you had the idea for like mossy oak in your head, you know, because obviously you're passionate about it. The turkey's head, you bit with the bug. It's, you know, of course you start thinking about things, but what was the lead time on that before you actually launched? You know, it was oh, a long time on that. So uh, quick as I can say it. So, but it, it definitely, the, 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 the key thing was as I start to go with daddy and he was, he grew up, like I said, he killed his first one in 1944. And that's not long after they're almost extinct. He grew up where there were turkeys, he was in a, a club with some friends of his. He grew up next door to had had land and a the the club I grew up fortunate enough to hunt on uh, in a hunting club there started in 1926. That's how old wow. it's been there, and it was a turkey hunting club in 1926. Only in later years did they get deer down there. So he was really from the his, from the origins of the sport and everything. Oh, but it's, Ask Did me you the have question. any photos from that back from that camp? Did they have any photos from the twenties or thirties? Oh yeah, oh yeah. But um, ask well, you asked me the ask, what was the original question, and I got up on a tangent. Basically, it's like since you're so passionate about turkeys, how long did you start thinking about mossy oh. oak before you started it? 
that's a that's a whatever oh my kids call it old time he's setting in so say eight or nine years old i first go with him and he was from that school that old school group and, and one of the things was like just like law you had to build a blind there was no such thing as just setting up to a turkey in a good big tree or in a little brush or something every i mean they just ingrained it in me you can't hunt a turkey without building a blind well and i started looking at what they had to wear and of course, the other, they better build a blind. It stuck, stuck out like you know what. And so uh, even, you know, some of the kind of tiger stripe, a little darker. I'm not saying it's always good to be dark either, but there was some stuff that looked pretty good. But still, everybody built the blind. And I would always say, as we began to hunt together and I get older, I say, Daddy, if we can just get right up there, we can kill him. Can't you do that, son? We'll make too much noise building a blind. We got to back up. <laughs> and that's just awesome. You know, even back then, my mind just jumped in. If, you know, if I just, you know, I'm in your kid playing for 10, if I just fell in by that big oak right there and was just, you know, my camouflage looked just like where I was sitting, I wouldn't have to worry about all that. Well, it was always in my mind. And I even to the point where I'd kind of tied out some stuff. And, you know, I got kind of anal about, you know, what I wore thinking, you know, it would help that. And, and um, I worked at a place called Brown Foods. It was a very, very back the largest meat packet plant in the South is where he worked too. And they get I earned a job in the marketing department. And uh, quite honestly, when I learned, I had no clue. When I, you know, I, I worked for a guy who'd been at General Mills. I worked for a guy who'd been at Procter and Gamble, uh, Lipton Tea, all these great brands. And I got to learn so much. It's almost like getting an MBA in marketing. And uh, I learned so much about, you know, solving consumer problems. And it just led me to go, nobody's done anything like this. I've seen a few things and it's like, it was even worse than what we used to have to wear. And it's like, I, I could do this, but I had no idea. I, that's a whole nother story beyond that. That was probably 24 years old. And I started at eight or nine turkey hunting, eight. So that's the, that's the time lapse. I love hearing that, man. That's awesome. So when you started, like you said, you tie dye your clothes. Did any of those older guys that you hunted with were they like, "Come on, kid, what are you doing?" Did like they well, doubt you? What I was tie dyeing, I was taking something that was already a printed camo pattern, ex military stuff is all it was, and I was trying to tint it with some. So I wasn't actually doing my own tie dye pattern per se, uh, you know. And I did some drawing with magic marker to make it a little bit different, but that's all I could do. But no, I didn't actually tie dye it and wear that so it wasn't that goofy but it was a little bit different in that i had tried i was trying to tint it a little different color some of the stuff we had we couldn't even find it it was almost a white background you know and i know in some circumstances in wide open country you know light spots help and can help break you up but not in the turkey woods no sir you I know love talking, those stories your original pattern was bottom land that's right and, and through the through the years, it evolved into a variety of different iterations. But now, look at how popular that um, initial pattern is again. And I think it's like the younger generation discovering just how good it was because it took the world by storm. I remember that back in like the first first outfit I ever bought was Moss Yoke, and I bought it from an ad on the back of Turkey Call magazine. That was in 1988 or 89. Yep. And because I saw the effectiveness shots and I'm like, holy cow, that's the dangest thing I've ever seen. Now look at it. It's come full circle and you're right back to where you started because the effectiveness was so good. And I guess I'm complimenting you basically on getting it nailed out of the gate because you nailed it. You know, uh, it's crazy. And like right now, it's yeah. unbelievable. I mean, you know, uh, there's, there's, um, uh, more demand for mossy oak like camouflage uh ever and you know it's led by bottomland our original stuff and part of that is you know yeah they rediscovered it and i think there's kind of a satisfaction with people knowing something really simple mm -hmm. you know as you know it's very simple and uh really works something original you know authentically original from the first days really really works and we don't need a whole bunch of other complicated stuff this this simple old and people yeah you know, the retro thing is popular too but um you know what's what's cool is there's people that have been there and stayed there their whole life with it 
And so most of the new branded offerings that we have, in fact, all of them now actually, have a bottomland background to them just to tie it together as a brand in the look of it. But what was honestly, the initial, I'm um, sorry, Toxie, what was the initial reaction? Because Mark, you said you were like blown away by it. Like was everyone across the board like, I can't even believe this. Like we needed this all along. You know what I mean? Or was there like some skeptic to it or like how'd it go? There was some skeptic, but I mean, I think most of who we were able to influence were pretty blown away. It seemed that way. I don't know. But, I, just, you know, we, we didn't get out to a wide audience. It just grew. You know, everything about us has been totally organic. So over time, uh, most people that did, you know, were very fired up about it. Because what would sell it would be not as much, you know, Mark saw an ad and he put it on. And you can kind of, when you're wearing something, you can pay attention to it. But um, – when somebody went with a buddy and their buddy had it on, that's when it really lit them up. Cause then they were looking at them going, Oh my gosh. You know? <laughs> yeah. Like a stronger word. And, uh, so I've said all along the, the best salesman is someone already has it on and they can see for themselves. There's, you know, there's no gimmick about that. It's the truth of what they're looking at out there. Um, you know, there's no one camo pattern for everything. There's, there's a better one for all kinds of different situations and, you know, we have some very specific stuff. Some some sports, you can kind of predict what your background is going to look like or the situation you're going to be in. I mean, even like being in a duck blind is pretty predictable and stuff. Some places not. But if you just had to pick one pattern today and kind of trust it for everything, um, which is where a lot of people are at, uh, we, you know, we're, we're pretty comfortable where our bottom line is. Yeah, big time. That's well, I said I ordered it. I ordered it in 89 because that's when we met. We were at a calling contest and I didn't know Toxie. I didn't know who he was. And I was at a contest and he came up to me. I was actually doing an interview with a, with a rider about the calling contest. And he walked up and he goes, hey, I'm just curious. What, what's your favorite camouflage pattern? And I said, well, I just ordered a, a whole set of Mossy Oak Bottomland from an ad on Turkey Call Magazine. I'm waiting for it to get in. So that would have been February of 89. And that's that's how we met. He goes, well, I'm Toxie Hazy Inventor. When you're done with this gentleman, I'd like to talk to you. And then then that's how we met. And then we've been best of friends ever since. I That's can't awesome. remember if I gave you a little bit or I made you go ahead and pay for it. I can't remember. <laughs> I had already ordered it, so it was shipping. And But then when I met you, of course, I, I met him and I said, my spring break's coming up in about three or four weeks. I would love to come to West Point and work for you for a week. I'm very intrigued by this whole industry. So I drove to West Point and spent my spring break down there. I was in college at the time. And I, he invited me to stay with he and Diane, and I did. And we just have been best of friends ever since. So I'm sure I got some camouflage that trip. <laughs> <laughs> you get yeah, yes and uh that that's you know that's such a rare coincidence i mean we were so i mean just to paint the picture we we're, we're living in a 1100 square foot house and um you know the the payment on was like 280 bucks a month or something like that um we lived off my wife's teaching salary for two years when we first started so when mark got there i still wasn't able to pay myself anything out of the business we were literally hand to mouth at the time and to think that, you know, when Mark said that, he, he kind of phrased it wrong. He said he said it like he was being polite in typical Mark fashion, who doesn't take no for an answer. He was like, hey, I'm coming to stay with you and I'll work for free. And, of course, at the time, man, I'd already, you know, we already struck up this chemistry already. And I really wanted to get, you know, do it with him. But I was like, at the time, I'm thinking, a whole week of free labor? Oh, you kidding me? <laughs> and he did came to work. He jumped in. And I mean, he asked a million questions. He was helpful everywhere. I mean, you know, and then when he left, he said, Hey, I graduate because I think you were just a sophomore. If I'm not mistaken, you were 19. I was young, yeah. but I, I yeah, I, he said, I graduate. I'm going to call you now and go to work for you. Just like instead of just asking, he just pretty much told me. And I was like, <laughs> Yeah, okay, sure. You know, and I, you know, we stayed in touch. That was, that part was great. But then, you know, off and on. And then he called one day, said, Hey, I'm done. Where, where do I, where do you need me to start? He didn't forget. And, you know, it's weird. If he'd have done it two months before, I wouldn't have known what to say. But we had just started a sales group to sell direct, you know, have our own salespeople. And we had just made the conscious decision with me, Bill, uh, Cuz, Bob Dixon, one of the true pioneers who Mark and I both love so much we lost. But we had just decided we need to bite off. We had Cecil Carter 
who uh, worked for another rep group and was in that. Anyway, he just decided we needed uh, someone in that, what do we call it, the mink states? Isn't that right, Mark? Yeah, Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas. Yep. And so, I mean, literally not – I hadn't even thought about it. I just knew we had – and it was literally a week or two even. The phone rings and it's Mark about that. And I was like, wow, oh, yeah, I did tell him that. Maybe that's the perfect fit. We'll see. And, man, he hit the ground. And he lit the scoreboard up. I mean, it didn't take him any time. And, uh, you know, that was the best thing that could have happened to him because he's traveling, seeing all these different sporting goods stores, talking to all these different people, getting perspective from a wide range about the whole industry. So it was a it was an amazing time. Honestly, I mean, the good old days are right now. I've been so blessed. I can't even – this whole thing's a miracle. But, man, those days were so much fun, too. They were they really, so awesome because we really didn't know, right? We didn't know. You know, we were, we were just uh, doing what we thought was best. We were young, you know. I was very, very green, young. Green and, is, I think, one of my greatest, <laughs> one of my greatest like secrets to success was being that I was so naive. I didn't know nothing. I didn't know what I was doing wrong, you know. And yep. to get in my way. That last I'm, episode, Mark, you were like so naive. You you said that last episode, the last Turkey OG's episode, that you were so naive. Oh, I was so naive. I called Harold Knight and said, I'm starting a game call company. Would you help me learn how to build some of this stuff? He invited me down to tour the plant. That's what I was talking about. What a gentleman Harold was. I didn't get that answer from most that I called, but Harold and Preston were the two companies that said, here's our vendor list here. Let me help you in any way we can. And the rest, rest, weren't, rest weren't like that. But uh, I was naive enough to ask them to help me. Yeah, I have I haven't run into any of that in our industry. I can assure you that's 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 pretty unique to game calls, I believe. Well, if Harold had a camouflage company, he would have helped you. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I love hearing that stuff, man. Like to me, just because I was born in '90, so hearing about like some of this stuff, just like getting its roots and the foundations poured, and like and also hearing like Mark, you were just so eager and motivated to help people out and, and in Toxie, like you just like passionate about it, starting your business, not knowing what the future could hold. Like that's exciting stuff. I think for me and guys, my age and younger to hear, especially whether they're passionate about hunting or something else. It's just nice to hear that from guys like you, because you just never know what can happen. And with sure. a little elbow grease and some passion, things can go a really long way. Yeah. And I think one thing I would school people about is just, I, I, I spend a lot of time with, you know, we have a lot of employees and stuff too. It's like helping people stay out of their own way. I've had to learn how to kind of get out of my own way. I know Mark has had to do that. And you learn that, you know, through trial and error and stuff. But um, just don't compare to other people. I mean, so I know it's competitive. We compete with different people. And if you're constantly just watching what they're doing, trying to worry about what they're doing, step in front of it or stay ahead of what, just, just be yourself. And be grateful and happy for what you, you know, hopefully you find your calling. And I always describe it as if, you know, um, when your feet hit the ground in the morning, you can't wait to get to work because you love it so much. That's the way we ought to be spending our time. So, if, and I know a lot of real honorable men just have to do something they don't like, take care of families. And that's unbelievable. And they're heroes. But if you can ever get like what you're doing, you can tell you love what you're doing right now and you're good at it. And that's what I would say. If, and if you get there, don't compare. Are we number two or number three or number five or whatever? Just be so grateful you're getting to spend time, which is your most valuable resource. Let's face it, it's just running out all the time. Uh, doing something you love. And uh, I think that I, the reason I went on about that is that's exactly how Mark's been. He might look around some, but he's too busy being himself and getting on with stuff, really busy uh to worry too much about that i love that advice it's it's sound advice i can promise you that so i i want some advice on killing a turkey toxie you've been hunting a long time what Man. are some of the things what are some of the things that through time you've evolved and said okay these are things that really help me quite often when it comes to killing a turkey two or three tips that a help you a lot and then a few things that you you have made mistakes within the past and perhaps you see others making some things that are probably hurting them more than helping them okay um 
just made a couple of notes to think about. I'm going to say the first one is not necessarily a tactical thing, but I wanted to go back and give a nod to Mr. Fox. So when I was a kid, he was kind of looked up in that peer group of those turkey hunters that have been turkey hunting all their life. He was kind of looked up as the, like the woodsman. You know, he was always like the best squirrel hunter with a 22. That took a lot of woodsmanship and all. And like stalking a deer in open woods, you know, and even in turkey hunting. So he was looked up to a lot on that. And there were some great turkey hunters. They wouldn't, I'm, I'm not anointing him as the greatest one they had back then, but he was really, really looked up to about that. And people would ask him because, you know, the calls we had were the only mouth calls that were ever made back then. They weren't even on the market. There was a private league, a guy in Mobile, Alabama made them named, uh, I think, Jack Davis. And then there was people that could call with a mouth call for the first time and sound really good, better than like the boxes and stuff back then. And that's what I'm getting at. They would say, Mr. Fox, what do you think is most important? Thing, uh, you know, in turkey hunting. And he would always say, because he would expect people to say, well, you know, that pretty yipping will do it for you and, and draw me in or something. He would say, in my opinion, the most important thing to being a great turkey hunter is knowing the lay of the land. Boom. That's how he said it, just like that. And so there's a lot of little snippets of wisdom to come off of that. And Mark can see that immediately. And I will just vouch for myself is map self a lot now when you go somewhere new. But if I'm hunting, not just my home place, but someone I'm, I'm familiar with and I've been before, I'm twice as good, three times as good as I am on a new place in a new area, have no clue what's going on. You know, I hear turkeys and I'm, you know, I'm, it may work out. Maybe if there's a lot there, but there's some wisdom to that knowing the lay of the land thing. So, you know, there's a deft touch to scouting and knowing your place without disturbing much. And Mark's a master of that too. Both of us are real anal about not disturbing your property much, but really knowing and having a sense of where you are, the way the land lays, the creeks, the bottoms, the draws, all of that stuff is so important. Um, as far as calling, um, I would say for me, I've seen a big difference in some things. I mean, there's, there's so many, you know, I'm, I'm not a big believer that, you know, here's Johnny Joe over here and he's yapping and he sounds average or whatever. And then here's Mark, he's former world champion, grand national champion and all that stuff. Pretty shepping you ever heard. And turkeys aren't going, hmm, Mark Shepin's prettier than his. I think I'll go to Mark. You know, that's just not necessarily how turkeys work. I'm a big believer in maybe sometimes it helps me to be sure to sound like more than one turkey. Now, I, you know, sometimes you soft pedal a turkey that's been bothered a bunch or you're in a pre precarious setup or whatever. But if you're comfortable with that, and I think especially if there are hens involved, I tried to pull out, for me, flate, box, mouth call. And to be sure they sound different enough that it's clear it's three different turkeys. And I'll, yep, on my mouth call, answer with a slate, cut back, and yep, on, yep back at that on a box call. And I might even have a fourth call with a distinctly a little bit different hen sound. I'm just trying to give the impression it's not just one hen over the, yep, yep, yep. That it's multiple of turkeys. Now, you still have to be careful. You can mess that up, too. But I will say over time, it seems like um, I've killed a lot more turkeys than I might have otherwise doing that. So anyway, just the simple version is try to give the impression there's more than one turkey there. And Mark can comment on that. No, I, I agree totally. I, I want to know, go a step further, things that you perhaps see people make mistakes at you know in other words let's try to help people avoid making mistakes or things you've done that you no longer do that because you think right. like well i might have made a mistake and i'm talking tactical you know yeah i i along those lines and not as not as much on the calling um i think one would be giving up too quick everybody gets so addicted to making them gobble you know blowing out of the blowing crow calls making them gobble cutting out them making them gobble and whatever and so i would say one of my little snippets I would definitely stand up on is like making one gobble and then calling one in is two totally different things. Mm -hmm. So it might not be in your best interest. Just keep on and keeping on. I know it, I love to hear them gobble at me. Uh, but uh, I think that if you get around one thing, if you get around field turkey, sometimes you can learn a lot more. 
because you watch or if they're in the open in the woods, you can watch what's going on. And so many times when I've actually could see the turkey way out there, but still could tell what's going on. He just shut up because a hen came to him that he could breed. And, you know, maybe 20 or 30 minutes of nothing. And most people get up and leave. And I would have probably too been impatient. You know, the worst thing you have is a place with a lot of turkey sometimes because you're not patient enough. Um, but I, then you sit there and watch and, Sometimes the easiest turkey to call is one who's just bred a hen. He's so crazy hot, hormones raging, and he can't find another hen, he might come running to you, you know? So um, patience. Um, I, one little thing, if, you know, it's really, you know, today, you know, we got decoys and stuff. That's changed a lot. But even prior to that, we, we you know, and Mark and I hunted together. We would always buddy hunt. Rarely would we sit side by side. One would give it up for the other one. What's funny is the guy in the back would more times than not end up killing the turkey. It's amazing how they get around the guy in the front. But you would always call it buddy hunting. And Harold and David showed me that first. You know, the front guy's maybe 40 yards in front. So, you know, when he hangs up within 60, 70 yards of you, you know, he's dead to the other guy. But here's one of the things I would be conscious of when I'm buddy hunting is if you've been working a turkey, and he gets quiet and all this happens. Have something ahead of time where you can, like if I'm back calling for someone, they may be ready to go or do something different or whatever. They're waiting on me. I will never just get up and go get them because I don't know what's going on. They may be looking at a turkey that's coming or something. So have be, be careful how you buddy hunt that you have some kind of signals like, hey, I'll crow call one time. And if you don't see or hear anything, and want to leave, and then you, you know, crow call back, and then we'll leave. Because what I'm getting at is I, I've busted turkeys quite a few times, not paying attention to that. Hey Amen. We always whistle like a quail. Yes. That's, <clears throat> yeah. And I, if you're not far, I'll just, just like whistle. Yeah, I do that. Yeah, that's good advice. That's cool, too. Like, I've done that with my buddy Austin, buddy hunting like that. We didn't pre-set up that yep. like communication and then you're just like it's you're just waiting it out until you're like all right the turkey's gone or whatever happened but yeah that's worst nightmare messing up a turkey for your buddy just because you got impatient and had to walk over there yeah no, I, I just tell you if you've never done that what tox is talking about buddy hunting we call it float calling if you've never been that back caller you've never had more fun than okay. being that guy especially if you've got one playing well and he's coming nice yeah. I mean, you can literally drive your friend in front of you crazy by making him gobble when you want to and pulling that turkey right into his lap. There's nothing more enjoyable in the spring for me than to be able to be the back caller and work oh, that turkey. Man. And plus, you know, if you get back there, you kind of lay down and get hidden Lags. really good. You know, if you got to scratch your butt or swat a mosquito, it's not the end of the world. Um, you know, because it's when you're in, when you're on point in the gun, unless you're hitting really well, it can get miserable. Woo! It can. Yeah, fall, it can. legs falling asleep and everything else. Oh, I, had a, I had a day with Terry and Kunog one day where I was the caller all day long, and I called in three different turkeys on three different setups, and Kunog missed all three of the turkeys on Phil. Oh. <laughs> After that third one, we went back to camp and had some margaritas. <laughs> Bless your heart. And, you know, once you, that's the bad. Once you get the yips. It, it'll stay on you it, it does <laughs> yeah and i would say in general uh again not anything specific just you know write it on your forehead where you can read it when you get patience you know just be patient just because one didn't answer you uh you know if you know there's turkeys there <clears throat> you know bob dixon used to say in a lot of cases you know, he loved to make them gobble too it's like uh, you know, yep at them like, um, you know, you you only have a limited amount of yelps. And what he was just saying is don't overdo it if you don't have to. I do think that over the course of a morning and you're working a turkey for an extended period, I think the more you've poured it on, you probably tended to kind of you know, lose his attraction to you as time goes on. So, I mean, maybe – you don't play your whole hand right away. Now, you know, it's different up in the morning and you strike a turkey moving around and you know he's hot. It's fun to pour the cold to him. 
But, um, you know, maybe being sparing about things, you know, he would just say, yep, like you're only got a few, a certain amount to use and don't use them up if you don't have to. And there's some wisdom with that. I guess the, the real point of it is they're all different. If you've hunted him before, you know more about it. If he hadn't been messed with at all, you know, you know that too. Uh, they're all different. There's no toxic mark. Anybody else can give you the exact formula. Um, that's the best part about it, I think. Yep, that's right. Go learn it yourself. As you know, go skin your knuckles up, screwing up like we did, and uh, and learn. This whole conversation has me wanting to go tomorrow morning. <laughs> oh, I'm wanting to go with you tomorrow morning, not just go. I mean, <laughs> because um, one of my, I've had so many. I mean, literally hundreds of favorite hunts, but uh, and Mark and I have had a bunch of them. But the time that he and I called one up for my dad about 15 years ago, maybe 12 years ago. Uh, on my place this turkey it was up in the morning a little bit and this turkey was smoking hot well mark piles in literally maybe only 30 yards from daddy and they were filming him and i was back another 30 yards behind mark well of course this turkey's in a road and he's pretty much going to come up this old sand road and so mark pours the i mean mark's pouring the cold to this turkey and he goes crazy I mean, he literally was, he would gobble eight times in five seconds. It was crazy. He was gobbling so much and he was so hot. He could hear both of us. And then, you know, Mark had a phone. He, he, you know, I'd get quiet for a second. He'd say, keep calling. And so what happened was the turkey came up and he was like 25 steps from my dad and he couldn't see him. And of course we had been pouring it on and he knew he was plenty close enough to see whatever hen was there. And he just put that X there and he wouldn't move. And for like 15 straight minutes, he breathed solar flame flares on my dad. And we've got the video. It's literally 15 straight minutes of the most loud gobbling you've ever videoed on a video camera. And this sounds like Darth Vader. Because he's breathing so hard, he can't control how excited he is. <laughs> and he's shaking like a leaf. And finally... For whatever, I guess maybe Mark shut up and then I called, you know, back further. Something made him step out from behind there and he finally killed him. And the turkey almost got away, knocked him down. He was fine. And Mark went out to get him and he started to flop off. And I still remember Mark going across the road. It looked like someone diving for a touchdown in the Super Bowl. And he dove out literally and landed in the. <laughs> he, he wasn't was going to. He wasn't going to get away. <laughs> I can help it. <laughs> My dad was so out of breath and so shook up. I and mean, then his hands were looked just like that when we got back to him. It was so much. Fun. And that's one of my most memorable as well. It was an absolute honor to be out there with you and Mr. Fox and um, Tox and I talk about it all the time. We were blessed with two of the most unbelievable dads in oh. the world. We, we have a little rule, the, the Ralph Fox rule. Like if, if we have a, you know, a decision to make or a way to go in life or whatever it is on a daily basis. If you just think, what would Ralph or Fox do? You'll make the right choice a hundred percent of the time. I just got, I did that. I get chill bumps when he talks about it. Cause Mark actually said that first. And when he did, I mean, that's a long time ago. And he was talking about something that had him kind of, let's just say it a dilemma is like, do I do the right thing? Or I'm scared. Like what's the best thing for business, maybe in the right thing or whatever like that. And it's like, well, you made, you did the right thing. You did the honorable thing, dude. He said, you know, I asked myself, what would Ralph or Fox do? And when I looked at it that way, it was really easy. And I, I mean, it just, I got shook. I mean, I got a little, you know, watery eyed thinking about it, but from then on, I've had the same thing, you know, I just kind of write it somewhere where I don't forget it when I'm coming to a crossroads on something. And uh, we're, we're so blessed to have someone like that. They both had that um, kind of outside in where they cared about everybody else over their self so much and had that big in life personality. To, you know, uh, he could just like he was probably even more effervescent than daddy. And I know daddy's well, more well known in today's world, but he could he could diffuse people being all grumpy with humor, you know. It was funny. He would almost be like, come on, man. And he, he could diffuse about any situation with a little bit of humor. And that's such a great, you know, art form. I wish more people today had their touch at that. Daddy's the same way, you know, just don't take yourself so serious. 
Amen. Yep. Amen. God, what a good podcast, Kurt. I, I knew this was going to fly, dude. This so one it, went fast, man. I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> looking it, at the time. Yeah, I catch myself preaching. I don't want to come across that way, but I just, I do want people to learn from whatever perspective I've had in this walk and, you know, what um, just, you know, every day slips by and then it's done and you can't get them back. And so that's why I'm so grateful because, you know, if you lose a great relationship or maybe a relationship with someone didn't turn out like you thought, uh, it hurts. You think about all the wasted time, so to speak, when we can't go back there. That's why when you have someone that we care so much for, like Mark and our families do about each other, it's such a prize in life. And then also teaching people in, in the way they go about hunting. It's like, maybe it's okay. You know, it's okay if you be proud of how big the deer is and killing the limit and all that. But be sure to don't forget there's more than just that, you know, in every day to get outdoors. Think about all the people that can't do that. Man, there's so many people that can't do that. And just, you know, enjoy every minute you get to because sooner or later, all, all of us, we're not going to be able to again. And uh, I just want to get every, soak every minute out that I can. I mean, I've gotten to where, you know, even if I get home, I'm not living, you know, where there's turkeys right at my house and all, but I just get out in the yard and do stuff because I want to be outdoors with nature, you know, just I'm addicted to it. So, sure. so well said, so well said, always as much philosophical as it is tactical when it comes to talks. And that's what I've, that's why I've always been so enamored with him. Like I remember when we used to have our sales meetings with the rep group, he talked about like my favorite part of the sales meeting was when Toxie would get up and talk. He is just such a gifted public speaker and he's such a motivator. And I think that's why his, his company is filled with people that have been there for life. And that's why oh, he's just the best. I appreciate that. But I'm telling you, um, I'm just, I, owe it to a bunch of great people and uh, i'll tell you the other thing too is exciting mark saw it just this last weekend the younger generation you know i'm so proud of my sons but there's a bunch more bill's son and a bunch more here uh and they're they're toting they're toting the mail and they get it and they understand they're actually as good or better than me and mark even of understanding you know smelling the roses you know of having a great life outdoors uh and it makes, makes me very proud to see them coming on uh, and being an influence on the younger generation. It's, it's amazing what's going on. There's, I don't know if it was COVID, but there's been such a positive energy to hunting and outdoor fishing, all of that. Uh, and uh, at least from our perspective, everything, uh, the attention to stuff, the business, all of it. And uh, I think people are waking up. They, We've experienced so much. It's kind of like the world's in a divide between all this technology-driven entertainment and then kind of the, for lack of a better word, the God-given entertainment. And uh, I just believe you got to have, you can have the, you know, entertainment, the electronic entertainment, but um, you got to, you, you can or maybe not, but you got to have, you got to be able to touch, you know, nature and do stuff. And um, it's so important. Especially yeah. getting kids to touch it right now. So, but you know, my favorite is turkey hunting. It's the easiest to get someone hooked on. The only thing is just you know the limited access. Uh, there's a lot of good public hunting stuff, but then that's kind of tough sometimes. Sometimes those people don't have the best manners, you know, and it's hard to you know you go hunt turkeys. Everybody's been messing with already. That's tough. I wish for everybody to experience um, a spring morning like me and Mark get to experience though. So, Big time. That'll be the first thing I probably get my daughter into is turkey hunting, just because the interaction yeah. and all that. So that's I'm looking forward to that day. And How old is she? She's three and a half. She, oh, she'll, yeah. be four, she'll be four in May. So yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a you know, especially today with the little blinds and stuff. You know, they what it could be, it could be four or five, it could be eight. You could, just, but but getting them out there for the first time, uh, and not even having the pressure of, you know, some of them put, I think we put too much pressure, getting them ready, getting them shooting a 410, getting them ready. And like, you know, they have to be the one to kill one. Just take them with you. When yeah. you think they're old enough to put up with, a, you know, a little cold weather or a few mosquitoes or sitting still for 30 minutes or something like that. And, um, just get them out there. Cause I tell you what, you talk about your life changes. That's Mark. <laughs> when you take a kid for the first time, it just changes you forever in a cool way. The coolest way, yeah. actually. I think I'm going to try 
Go ahead, Mark. Sorry. There were several times I took Taylor. We were just calling them up. We weren't killing them. We just call them up and make them gobble. And she finally said, I want to kill one. And I said, good, I want you to. <laughs> that, was, that was her genetics coming on out. <laughs> that's, that's good advice, man, because I, I take her with, her name's Isla May, and I take her with uh, shed hunting, and we spend more time jumping in muddy puddles. She likes to call it from Peppa Pig. So we go around jumping puddles and don't really find any antlers or even really look much for them, but. She's Solid. a little doll too, buddy. She's yeah. actually, she's trouble. Philosophical note, but it, this is actually from a famous uh, child psychologist. Um, the most important and critical relationship in the whole family is, is actually the dad and the daughter. Honestly, you know, if there's, it could be only girls in the family, but either way. And I started thinking about that, how important it was. They always said that the, the, the daughter has an emotional cup. And the only one can fill it up is her dad. And so when the dad doesn't do that, and it doesn't mean like dad buys her a bunch of stuff and just, you know, it means dad takes the time to spend, you know, your most valuable resource is your time, not like your money or your whatever else, your material possessions. So I think subconsciously, if you're not actually spending time with them, then you're not filling that cup up. I'm not sure, but that's what I believe. But um, my point in saying all that is, it just, I, w I went to, a, a, there was a place to duck hunt not far from there. was a public hunting, duck, duck hunting place when we didn't have a lot of duck hunting. And I went, and you had to go at four in the morning, you had to draw, and then you had, you know, depending on how you draw, you pick your spot and all. And it's a really cool place. It's called the Knoxville Wildlife Refuge. And they have some green timber hunting places. Anyway, I looked over there, and I'll never forget it just stuck with me. There was a mom at, you know, whatever, 20 something degrees. At 4.30 in the morning, no far, no telling how far they drove, she had her sons there. They were old enough to hunt on their own without, you know, whatever they were, but they couldn't drive. She had driven all the way over there to be sure they got to go do that. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, what kind of mom and then the mom and the son and the relationship. And then I got my first child was Sarah Francis. She was a baby when Mark stayed in the house that time. Um, and so we had that. She was all girl. She wasn't like a big athlete or a tomboy type of girl. She's all girl. You know, and but we had that hunting. She, you know, she killed a deer at like 10 years old. She killed a turkey at like 11 years old. And, you know, she doesn't go as much today. She's got three kids, but we had that. And so, in a lot of cases, what could there be for dad to have something in common with the daughter? No better example than Mark. You know, right. they're right there. Um, and so, you know, maybe it, maybe it's the son taking mom and, you know, but, not, you know, there's no sport you can have the relationship across, you know, the mom, the son, the father, the daughter, like hunting or maybe hunting and fishing and spending that time together. So, man, I encourage all those dads to do just like you're dreaming to do. And, you know, you don't have as far as if they go or they pull a trigger or not, let that be their choice. And like like Mark said with Taylor, I mean. I mean, she she volunteered on her own. He didn't have oh, yeah. to. But take them. It's so yeah. important. And I say especially for the dads of a daughter. Take them and positive reinforcement. Show them that you believe in them that they can. That's one of the best pieces of advice. Is one of the best things I ever heard Toxie ever utter in his life. They were asked, I don't remember who asked you, but they were asking you about how you got your start and why you kept going and, and what was something instrumental in your life. And he said, I had people that believed in me. And I'm telling you, that was like, I was like, oh my goodness, what great advice in anything in life, whether it be business or children yep. or family or relationships, you cannot have one better piece of advice to take away from this than that statement right there. People believed in me. So don't be, don't be afraid to be the person to show that belief in someone else. 100 percent and also because i would see how could i even do all this stuff and i noticed i had all these people around me that believed in me and so two things happen i think that somehow it gives you some kind of gift that we don't understand or whatever that goes on but then you don't want to let them down either both those things happen it's also a little bit of a turkey hunt lesson there mark because i do remember another old timer telling me what makes a great turkey hunter and they said and that's how mark is a great one always believes there's one behind the next tree. And what he's saying was, you're always optimistic. You don't get your head down. You aren't grumpy because they aren't gobbling good today. Or I didn't get to go to the best territory. Man, man, man. They're, they're positive. They're upbeat. And they're always believing it's going to happen. 
that's actually a great philosophy for turkey hunting. It is. And deer hunting. If you believe you're okay. about to kill one, you're yep. always in the game. That's a, that's a great piece of advice. I really like that. I, that's awesome. I feel like I try, I try to stay that type of optimistic when I'm hunting. Cause you just never know, but it's hey, like, you are Kurt. It's easier said than done. I promise. But it's, <laughs> yeah. Well, we've yeah. all, we've all met pessimistic yeah. people in our life. Like it's so easy to get away from pessimism and embrace optimism. I mean, it's, sure. it's just, I am blessed and so thankful that I'm not a pessimistic person. Like I, I think every yeah. day is going to be the perfect day. You know, I'm just the ultimate optimist to the point that sometimes I get in a bad situation because of it. But optimism mm -hmm. is, is a wonderful trait. If you don't have it, I'm, I'm sorry. Cause it, okay. it will lead you through life. I'm going to get some t-shirts printed for me and uh, Mark. And it's like, it's hip to be naive, man. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I love that. Hey, I man. do. I'm probably pretty dang naive if yeah. we're going to talk about it, but. And then I, I, you know, as I normally, I ramble on a lot of different topics, but uh, just, you know, um, start with like a one-sided box. I'm thinking about beginners now, a one-sided box and like a push button. Uh, look, you can, you can kill most, most any turkeys, me or Mark could kill uh, with those calls right there. And getting kind of your mind around listening to stuff people talk about as far as you know the woodsmanship part of turkey hunting you really can don't be in my guess what i'm saying don't be intimidated because you can't you know contest call with a mouth call do not and don't uh another big mistake people make they're so intent on being a guy quote unquote that calls them with a mouth call before they're ready don't use your best tool whatever call that is force the mouth call when you're not ready when you agree mark just having the confidence in that tool in yeah. other words i feel best in my sound with a box call then use the one you have confidence in because that's the one you're going to call the most with and and probably sound the best with so having confidence enough in it to use it is a big big part of the winning game yes absolutely kurt advice Love it. I'm getting, I'm getting texts from our next guest. He said, I've been sitting here for two hours waiting on you guys. <laughs> Good. That means this podcast went well. <laughs> yeah. I could do look, you could you should have known better than get me and Mark together. We didn't even get on half calling topics. Good. We could go for days. Our next guest is gonna be Ernie Calandrelli. So that's gonna oh. be another one that's gonna go wild. <laughs> hey, I hope everybody listens to him. Turn mine off if you have to listen to to get to listen to him. Ernie, so real quick, Ernie comes to the Texas camps uh, we've had over the years with customers, and, stuff, and he does the coolest thing. He is so old school from way back before me, Mark, anybody, and he will take everybody that kills a turkey while they're you know before the day's out. He'll take and make them their own wing bone call from the wing of the turkey they killed. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. He's, He's one of the good ones, like so many of these guys. We've been blessed with incredible guests on this series. And I was telling Toxie in a text, I was like, I sat down to create the guest list because I know virtually everyone in the turkey industry, much like Toxie. But I said, I want this to be special. And T Tracy and I were at dinner and I go, if you had your pick of somebody that would be on this OG series, but also meant a lot to me. And I mean, boom, boom, boom. She spit them out like that. All these guests came straight from Tracy's mouth. And I mean, it's, I told Tox that he goes, that is so cool. Cause she, Way much, cool. much like Diane, we both married way above our means and we've had incredible partners through life. And they, they know our, they know who's important to us. Like it, because oftentimes they were ordained by them, you know, in other words, like Tracy, the people that I am closest to are ones that Tracy loves the most, you know, cause I trust her opinion on people so much. She's like that with you, Kurt. She absolutely loves Kurt. She's been in love with Toxie since the first day she ever met him and, and all of these. And I think Diane's the same way. They will lead you down the straight and narrow path. Cause they, they are, they're like that, Doe in the greenfield, they know when danger's approaching and then they'll keep their spouse away from that danger. It's so cool because we just saw him last weekend and hadn't seen her in a while. And it's like she just lights up because, you know, we have that from since way back. Just like, you know, I 
it, it, at some point I have to separate Mark and my wife, Diane, they talk and talk and talk and talk. <laughs> and they just have, you know, just, there's just a common chemistry with the whole family. It's so cool. You know, I think we, we went to bed about what, 1230 that first night. That first night. I think it was a little later than that, actually. Yeah. And I had to make myself because we were just catching up on old times. It was a lot of fun. All over turkeys, too. Always over that. turkeys. Back to the yeah. first day we met. Turkey call and says, hey, can I come stay at your house? Yeah, we talked about turkeys ad nauseum that week. That's all we talked about. That and family and business and everything else. But turkeys are always that, that theme. Well, not to mention real quick, too, the reason I was at it because uh, – Cuz actually dragged me down there to it, but uh, when I got there, they were telling me about that. That's when I was, I went up to see you, and they said you need to, you need to go uh, get this kid on your pro staff right here. This young kid right here, he's winning all kind of contests. He's the hottest thing out there. This was the Natural Voice World Championship, smaller thing, much higher degree of difficulty. So Mark won the World, the Grand National, and the Natural Voice World Championship all. Oh before he was 20 something years old, early twenties, I'd say, right? Uh, yeah, certainly. I stopped calling, oh, in, I stopped calling in 96. So I would have been 30 then I was done calling by the time I was 30. Kind of humbling though, that you're out there and you're doing your best and thinking you're sounding great. And you got Mark, he doesn't even need the deck on. Yep. <laughs> Just like a hen, you know, it was crazy how much talent can God can roll up into one person, but he got big time. It's amazing. Well, Toxie, I appreciate this, man. I, this series, I talk the least and I more just absorb and ask a few questions that I love doing it because it's like, I don't know. It's just, I'm just, it's an honor for me to sit in with these Turkey legends. And it's like other people that don't know how this was like, you know, set up with Mark and, and everything like that. Are like, what's this guy, random guy doing with all these just like pioneers of hunting and the industry and, and turkey hunting in general but i'm just glad to be here man and i really appreciate your time and sharing the stories and the info with us don't don't short yourself you do a great job well, with this. got so many followers and whatever and just you know one last message i say just don't you know don't forget to enjoy every day like i talked about and appreciate it all. but just don't forget the only reason we get to do it is because of the bird and let's take this all do everything we can to take care of the bird we love so much. Yep. Uh, if you're not a member, if, if you're not a member of the National Wild Turkey Federation or Turkeys for Tomorrow, A, they're both great organizations. B, you can learn a lot from both. They're, they're, I would advise being part of both of them. Absolutely. Awesome. God bless you, Toxie Hayes. I love you like a brother. Thank you so much for doing this. You're the best, buddy. Look forward to sitting down with you this spring. Amen. Let's do it. All right, everybody. All right. Thanks, Toxie. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Y'all, I'll have a grandbaby by then. <laughs> oh, that'll be fun. Go, go shoot a boss gobbler. Good luck this season. Thanks, guys.